Tonight I'm going to talk about wound management in small animals and obviously it's a fairly prevalent thing we deal with and it's it's kind of a fun thing to deal with. It can be a very frustrating thing to deal with but it can also be very rewarding. So you know kind of the main goal is just to do some basic review over just general wound healing and then also kind of get into <clears throat> some other considerations we deal with when we're actually addressing these wounds and also try and touch on some of you know newer things that we're kind of looking at um, in how we can help these wounds heal. So first again a brief review of wound healing. They're basically three general phases of wound healing. The inflammatory phase, the proliferation phase, and the fibroblastic phase. And there's definitely some overlap with these, um, but essentially um, once we have damage to the skin or the subcutis, the platelets will initiate wound healing through the release of cytokines and essential growth factors. Um, these events of healing are then amplified, sustained, and modified by wound macrophages, endothelial cells, and fibroblasts that are recruited into the wound. Um, and then that wound matrix that's formed will also sustain and modify wound healing. So it's kind of a self-perpetuating cycle. Um, first, kind of briefly to talk about um, the the first phase, the inflammatory phase, we have the damage to the skin, a clot in the wound, tissue fluids are exuded and this damage and dead tissue, sometimes bacteria often, um, and that's when we kind of start getting this vascular permeability. These cells are activated, release the cytokines and call in these other cells um, through chemotaxis measures. Um, and we get um, kind of the stage set for this wound to start healing in this very early phase. Um, the proliferation phase, this is usually once we get these activated fibroblasts and endothelial cells which are regulated by the platelets and macrophages into the wound. Um, the fibroblasts will synthesize collagen and proteoglycans and elastin, all that kind of matrix material using a fibrin scaffold. And this is usually occurring by four and five days after the wound has um, been, has happened. Um, and then this new collagen network will then support these new uh, vascular uh, capillary buds that kind of start growing in. And this is really what we are talking about when we talk about our granulation tissue. This is that, this is why when we get a good bed of granulation tissue, it's very, it often rather friable bleeds, you know, that nice pink healthy granulation tissues because we're getting this scaffold and this ingrowth of new blood vessels. The final phase is the fibroblastic phase, and this is really a phase that can kind of go on for even up to a year after a wound um, develops because this is this deposition of collagen, this maturation of this scaffold and matrix here. Um, and the collagen is really kind of what's important, what's creating our scar. Um, without this strength of the collagen, the wound is going to be more apt to hiss. So this is, while it's a very kind of underlying phase throughout, it, it is a very important phase. And again, these do, as you can kind of see, there's definitely some overlap. We have this inflammatory phase, the proliferative phase, and the maturation uh, phase, and they're all kind of going on at the same time, or at least starting to overlap. Um, and you can see kind of as the time goes on, the wound strength will also increase and it's somewhat on a logarithmic scale. Again, that, that collagen getting in and forming is really going to contribute to that strength of the wound, which is really important for the long-term outcome. Other factors that are important in healing of the wound, epithelialization, those cells at the margin of the wound will proliferate and start to migrate um, under that scab or clot that's formed. Um, they kind of create their own little way as they go, secreting little enzymes to kind of create their path. Um, and sometimes in a, in a clean wound, this can start to occur within 48 hours. Um, and then, in addition to epithelialization, and often in conjunction, we have the wound contraction, where the myofibroblasts, they're, they're kind of elastic -y little cells, will attach to those underlying dermis and start to contract and actually literally pull the wound edges towards themselves, start to kind of pull that edge together. And that tension is important. We want that wound to contract, but always be aware of where this is occurring. Always think about, you know, if it's on the distal limb, some of that contraction may not be good. We start getting interfering um, with, with range of motion and things like that. So kind of always being aware of all these processes that are going on while that wound is healing. So this is kind of an example. I, this is not a pa patient of mine. I kind of borrowed this picture, but this, this is, I think, a good example of showing kind of all these different phases going on all at the same time in one wound in, in different levels of healing. 
Um, obviously, this is a, you know, a patient that's going to heal kind of, we're going to use that second intention healing. We'll get into kind of the details of that in a bit, but it just, I think, illustrates kind of these different phases, but also just how amazing some of this wound healing can really be, what we can really accomplish um, you know, by dealing, managing some of these wounds that we might think might not be manageable. So <clears throat> we've talked about kind of just the basics again. That was just kind of a brief review of wound healing. So now we're going to talk about kind of how we actually assess these wounds on our patients and kind of decision-making processes and how we're going to actually deal with these wounds, keeping those, the healing process in mind. So this is kind of a busy little uh, slide. You know, first when we're dealing with these wounds, we certainly have to decide, look at our patient. Is our patient stable? or unstable. Is that coming up? Okay, there we go. So if it's an unstable patient, obviously we have to focus on that and, and kind of get them stabilized. There are certainly some basic measures we can do to kind of keep things protected and clean, but of course we want to make sure um, we have a stable patient to begin with. Um, so once our patient is stabilized, then we can kind of look at the wound and really say, okay, what kind of wound are we dealing with? Um, and this, this can change along the way, certainly, but initially we have our stable patient if we have a clean and healthy wound, we kind of look and say, hey, is this something that we can take care of right away? Do we need to um, take a to step back and kind of give it time, or are these this wound clean, the tissue is relatively healthy? Maybe we can consider primary closure or delayed primary closure, even a, you know, a couple days, not necessarily waiting for that granulation bed, which remember occurs in about four to five days, um, to occur. Um, if primary closure is not possible, say it's kind of in a larger area or we're dealing with areas of tension, then we can consider things like flaps or grafts and tension relieving devices. If we have a contaminated wound, this is now a wound that we're not, say, we can't necessarily close right away with or without that tension. We've got devitalized tissues, a, a lot of, of contamination. Then we have to consider um, secondary closure. Oops, that came all together start looking at our wound cleaning, debridement. This is where, you know, commonly we talk about what to dry bandages. We'll talk about some other options, certainly, from that. Um, until we get that healthy granulation bed that's formed, and then we consider our secondary closure and second intention healing. And so that really kind of brings us, once we've evaluated our patient, evaluated our wound, looking at types of closure, um, it is important to remember that when we're dealing with these wounds, sometimes we're not always seeing what can develop. Either one, there might be more to the wound, <clears throat> excuse me, than we're seeing externally. You know, some of these, you know, this is a little bit beyond the scope to talk about penetrating wounds into the abdomen and thorax, but that definitely, sometimes the wound, what we're seeing can be the tip of the iceberg. But also a time, you know, we may not be seeing the full extent of damage that has yet to develop in this wound. So it's really important to not rush into these. There's really not much risk that you're going to create um, in delaying an aggressive wound management after a trauma. You've got the time to kind of evaluate it. If you act too quickly, you could end up in trouble because you might have um, inadequate or excessive treatment and certainly in a more unstable patient you might incur in more anesthetic risks. Um, Certain types of wounds, we certainly talk about open fractures. Um, again, we want to make sure that we're, our, open, our conditions are met that are going to be sterile. If it's a very contaminated wound and we put a plate in that wound, we're, going to, we're asking for an implant infection. So again, the bone will heal, but we need to make sure we have the best uh, environment possible. So certain deeper structures, tendons, ligaments, and nerves might have to be addressed right away. Um, but again, the, the idea is that we want to make sure we're fully assessing that wound and, and doing what we need to do, um, but not getting too aggressive too quickly. Um, open joints, certainly there's going to be a risk of arthritis developing kind of regardless of what we do. Again, we want to get those cleaned, but keeping in mind the overall rest of the wound, soft tissue losses, skin losses, things like that. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. So first, evaluations of the wound, and these are some of the basic measures we can do even in our unstable patients to try and help protect, get an idea of what we're dealing with, which also is important when we're talking with our patients or with our clients, you know, client communication, you know, getting at least a good idea of the extent of the wound now, realizing that time can definitely change things. Um, clipping is, you know, 
uh, why we have a whole slide to it, but it's important. It, I often see, you know, clipping, you know, kind of right to the edges of the wound. One, you can miss other puncture wounds, things that may not be apparent, bruising that may suggest there could be deeper tissue damage. And also when we're dealing with possible ultimately closure, it gives us, you know, we want that sterile feel. We don't want to pull this thing closed and then end up with hair right in the edge of the wound. So it's never going to hurt to clip as wide as you can. Um, using sterile lubricant in the, in the wound itself will help prevent the, the hair from getting into the wound um, as you're clipping. And while we're doing this, it gives us the opportunity, again, even in an unstable patient that may have some heavy pain medications on board, we can even still maybe get by with a little bit of a clipping and kind of getting an idea of what we're dealing with looking at lines of tension and starting to anticipate, you know, what, how are we going to deal with this wound? How are we going to start thinking about closing it? Um, lavaging the wounds. Um, the, it, with lavage, it's really, the, it's actually more the physical aspect, the mechanical aspect of lavage that's most important, not actually what you're using to lavage. Um, and so, the appropriate pressure that we want in a wound is about anywhere from 4 to 15 psi, depending on what you read. Too much can actually create, push bacteria deeper into the wound. So there's a little bit of a balance. Um, a 20 cc syringe, an 18 gauge needle, usually deliver a good amount of pressure. Um, we do think a little bit about what we use. We don't want to hurt the cells that are the wound environment. So LRS is, is theoretically the least damaging to cells, although typically we'll usually grab saline. Um, which is which is fine. Chlorhexidine um, does have residual activity and works in organic debris. Iodine does not. Um, and I know we all probably do the eyeball test to see how much chlorhex we want, but really technically we should be measuring it out. One part of two percent to forty parts of saline or twenty-five to one um, dilution to make sure we get that appropriate concentration which will still have that residual effect in these wounds. Um, hydrogen peroxide and bleach are not good in any kind of wounds. Um, typically what I'll do, if I have, I usually reach for saline initially. If I have a very contaminated wound, sometimes I will use the chlorhexidine, but I still usually follow with a final lavage of saline um, just to kind of, you know, kind of have just that saline fluid in the wound last. Um, this is kind of a setup, you know, that, that really works well. I see, all, you know, there's lots of different ways to kind of create a mechanism of flushing. Um, but w what I like is this is hooked to an IV bag. Um, we have an IV line with a three-way stopcock, the, the syringe, and the needle here. And it just makes it really easy to just pull the fluid and push it in the wound, pull the fluid. You know, I see people, you know, poking caps in the, the saline bottles. And there's lots of different little ways that people, little tricks people do. But... Again, we want to try and achieve that, that appropriate pressure in the wound, um, use the appropriate fluids, um, and get it as clean as we can. Again, these are sometimes our initial measures in the le less stable patient, too, that we're trying to get as quickly as we can. So, <clears throat> excuse me, what about infection? Um, and remember, we're probably, a lot of these, we're dealing with contamination and not necessarily infection. So it is important to make that distinguish, distinguishing factor. If we've had a dog that's been missing for five days and has a really nasty wound on its side, well, sure, that's probably infected. Um, but if we do have this significant contamination or evidence of infection, then we want to actually get the deep wound culture. So we don't want to just swab the stuff that's on the top of the wound. That is going to be... Um, a positive culture and the results we get may be resistant to everything or it's certainly not really clinically applicable. So after debris, our initial debridement of what we're going to do, initial lavage, we get a deep, as deep of a wound culture as possible to give us the most accurate picture of what's going on inside that wound. Um, wound infection will occur when there are more than 10 to the fifth organisms per gram of tissue. Um, and, and kind of keeping that in mind, there are a lot of factors that will lower that required number to create an infection, that being necrotic tissue, foreign bodies, dead space, seromas, hematomas, or excess sutures. Um, there are patient factors that will lower that number as well. Um, if they're systemic, have systemic disease, anemia, hyperproteinemia, these, you know, shocky animals. So a lot of times we do um, 
will reach for prophylactic antibiotics um, systemically while we're managing these wounds. And I will usually, you know, a lot of it will be based on kind of the extent and the wounds themselves and the patient's status. A lot of times in kind of a more stable patient with a more superficial wound, we might reach for something like spazolin, something that's a more, a bigger trauma, more unstable patient where I'm also worrying about more um, perfusion issues and things like that. We might do something like Batril Ampicillin or Batril Unison. Um, and again, starting those even if we've gotten or we're waiting on our culture results to get those kind of on board. All right, so we've kind of assessed our initial wound. We've kind of done the basic measures of, of clipping and lavaging. Um, and now we have to start thinking about we're going to presume we're now dealing with their stable patients. And so now we're going to start thinking about how we're going to close this wound. And this is kind of where the, some of the decision-making uh, processes come into play. So really there are three, four main types of wound closure that we deal with. Primary closure, this is within 24 hours. We have minimal tissue damage, minimal contamination. Um, we can close at that initial time when we're clipping and cleaning that wound. We're saying, hey, this doesn't look that contaminated. It is fairly, the edges are really fresh. We can get that closed, and, and there is tissue available to close. Delayed primary closure, now technically this is kind of within three to five days after a wound. This is before the granulation tissue is really developing. Um, so we still have minimal, maybe moderate tissue damage, uh, minimal and moderate contamination. And maybe we're going to be dressing a little bit. Maybe we want to get that minimal contamination clear before we close it. But we're still got good healthy tissue. We still got good tissue to in order that we can oppose. A lot of the wounds that I end up dealing with seem to be certainly these secondary closure or second intention healing. And now we're dealing in, this is after five days after the wound. Um, we're getting gr this granulation bed, and then we have to figure out kind of how we're going to deal with it. So there's going to be extensive tissue damage or contamination, and we need to give it time to get healthy. And in that time, the granulation tissue is going to form. Um, and the, we usually we're talking about repeated debridement. Um, and once we get that healthy granulation bed, then it's a matter of, you know, what do we have to close? Um, what can we bring together and how can we close it? Um, that's where if we have the secondary closure, and we'll talk about, you know, kind of the possible um, ways of doing a secondary closure. And then a lot of times, you know, there's, we have a lot of wounds that heal by second intention, and that's basically just we don't have those tissues or there's definitely plenty of cases that we come out, we start out with the anticipation of we're going to get this to a healthy point and then we're going to close it secondarily. And we get to that point and it's already contracting so well or owners have financial constraints and we can then still let those wounds heal by second intention. A lot of wounds can definitely heal by second intention. And that's basically just wound contracture and epithelialization. So to kind of review these, I guess, in a little bit more detail, um, primary closure again within 24 hours. We don't have as much tissue damage, so this is you know a fairly straight laceration with um, a sharp object. The edges are very clean, not very ragged. There's not a big flap of skin that we worry might necrose down the road. Um, so that is certainly an amenable one once we clip and clean that to just closing it primarily. Um, Again, this is kind of just the, the, this previous chart kind of broken down, but delayed primary closure um, before that granulation tissue starts. Um, if that, say that previous wound had a little bit more contamination in it, we wanted to maybe give it a couple days to kind of make sure there was no dirt, no debris. Um, and again, that would be the close enough together that we could basically just close it primarily. Secondary closure, again, after the granulation tissues formed, um, and then the second intention healing. Again, this is, this is I've come back to this example because it is, uh, you know, a, a good example of second intention healing that these edges are just kind of slowly pulling together. And sure, it would be faster to bring that together and do a, a secondary closure. Um, but if there are other factors involved, this wound will still end up going on to heal. And the timing of that is going to vary depending on, you know, patient status, client status, et cetera. All right, so we talk about kind of the ways we think about how we're going to close this wound. So now we're going to talk about kind of getting the wound ready to close. How are we going to debride that wound, get that wound bed um, healthy and ready um, to, to close? So 
Wound debridement is kind of where we talk about, get into, there's a lot of different possible means. Um, the four kind of main types, uh, surgical debridement, um, and again, I'll I have slides that kind of go through each of these, and we have this table, I think, in your notes. Um, enzymatic debridement, mechanical or bandaging debridement, um, and interactive dressings, which is kind of a little bit newer area where we don't have to work, we have use more physiologic debridement. So surgical debridement, we're dealing with extensive necrosis, debris, and deep tissue damage. And sometimes there really is just nothing like the scalpel blade to kind of get that out of there.